With this video, what I want to do is compare the column capacity based on the AISC steel specification to the theoretical capacity under ideal conditions. And, and so the way we're going to do this is really what I'm talking about here is we're looking at two primary limit states for columns. Now there are other limit states, uh, there are a lot of limit states you can consider for columns, but I just want to look at these two, yielding and then buckling. So yielding, if, if a column is going to fail under yielding, it's typically going to be short and stocky like this one here. And so of course the idea is we're going to put some compressive load on that column. And then this here, this area here, we're going to call that the gross area. And the force that would cause it to yield, I'm going to call that P sub Y. Um, that's pretty straightforward. P sub Y is equal to the yield stress, F sub Y, times the gross area, like that. Now buckling, of course, buckling is more of an instability type issue where if once I get to a certain load and P sub E over here, that stands for the elastic buckling force. Once I get to that force that's going to cause this to buckle, it will actually deflect out like this. And this, of course, is highly exaggerated. But the whole thing buckles out. Now, with this equation, one thing I want to point out is that this K here, that's called the effective length factor, and KL is the effective length, that tells you basically how this is going to buckle based on the end conditions. So for a column that's pinned top and bottom, you can see K is equal to 1.0. And I like to try to visualize this in a couple of ways. You can think about it, KL essentially, being the distance between inflection points. And or another way to look at that is that KL is the distance of a half sine curve in the buckled shape. So this is a half sine curve here. So KL is the entire length. And as you can see, you know, K is equal to 1.0, so that makes sense. Now it does, it is different for different end conditions. In this case, I have a column that's fixed at the bottom and it's pinned at the top. So when it buckles, it kind of comes out like this, but then it has to curve back because it has to go straight down at the bottom. Now in this case, you can see K is not equal to one and, and you can see it also with the deflected shape. There's an inflection point somewhere right around there, right? The curvature changes. Again, another way to think about it is that's the distance of the half sine curve right there. And so this distance here is KL, and it's about 70% of the total length. Okay, so that's how buckling works. Now, if we look at, depending on the length of the column, one of these two limit states is going to control. So if we plot that out, here's a graph here, and P sub N is the nominal capacity up here. K sub L is that effective length. Now, based on what we just said, there's going to be some yield force. So P sub Y, I said that was equal to F sub Y plus A times AG. Nothing in that equation has to do with the length. So that means that that capacity, that yielding capacity, is constant the whole way. So I'm just going to use a straight line here. Theoretically, once I hit that, Py, the section is going to yield and it will have failed. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, going back to the equation for flexural buckling, you can see that it is it is inversely proportional to this effective length squared. And so, if I'm plotting the effective length, it can start off, you know, for fairly low lengths, it can be pretty high, and it's going to kind of come down like this. So that's what P sub B looks like right there. So if I think about the column, if it's short and kind of stocky, like I was saying before, then yielding is going to control. But at some point, it gets to a situation where the buckling force, P sub E, becomes less than the yield force. And so that's what's going to happen. It's going to buckle before it yields. And so theoretically, I'm, I'm going to draw in a red curve here. So theoretically, the capacity looks like this, where it yields until it gets to a certain length. And then if it's longer than that, it will buckle at a lower force. Okay, now 
unfortunately this is well this is you know this is due to ideal conditions we assume ideal conditions but there are a couple of things that we have to account for um, when we're using the code equations so there's a couple of things that happen in the real world the first is residual stress and, and what's going on here is that when they, of course, when they manufacture these these wide flange sections, these W sections, they the steel is really hot. It's glowing hot. They run it through rollers, and then it's left to cool down. Well, during that cool down process, different parts of the section cool at different rates. And if you think about this flange here, it's got air on all three sides, and so it's going to cool down fairly fast. All four of these flanges, or I should say, all four of these flange sides. The web also, the web has got, the web has air on both sides, and so it's also going to cool down pretty fast. However, this part in right here, there's a lot of material there, there's not a lot of air around it, so this tends to cool down a lot slower. So there's this differential rate. The blue parts of the section tend to cool faster than, than the red here, where the web and the flange are connected. So what happens is that as that cools down at the, in that differential rate, you get what are called residual stresses, which means that the section literally has stress in it to begin with. And so when we start to load it up, it will actually start to yield before you hit that yield stress. Not the entire section necessarily, but parts of it will start to yield. So that's one thing we have to account for. The other thing is crookedness. The, the equation for P sub E that I gave you, it assumes that the column is perfectly straight. It has no tendency to buckle one way or the other. Of course, real columns aren't going to be perfectly straight, and um, so that will lower their capacity somewhat. So these two things need to be accounted for. And if you look at the equations in the specification, so here's the section that covers that. Uh, first of all, I'll point out a couple things. So L sub C here, that's the effective length, so that's K times L. They've just made that notation. And you look, the way the, the way the equation works to, to plot out the capacity, you've got actually two equations to get the curve. So if the length is fairly short, if it's less than this value here, then it's more of a yielding type failure. And you can see this, you've got the yield stress there, um, but this is the equation you use. If it's greater than that value, then you use this different equation and this F sub E, that's important here. Here's, here's what it is in the code. That's the equation that's given. Um, but really, all it is, is it is what I called P sub E over the gross area. Okay, so this is the stress that causes it to yield. I'm sorry, that causes it to buckle instead of the force. So we're just putting it in terms of stress. And you can see... FCR here, that's the critical stress, that's the controlling stress. Basically, it's 88% of that elastic buckling stress. And so, if I draw that, if I draw those two equations on this curve, it looks kind of like this. Kind of comes out like that. So back in here, the deviation is has mostly to do with residual stress that's causing the capacity not to be quite what it what it would normally be. Out here, it's that it's that crookedness. And so this I'm trying to draw this at 88% of the capacity. And so this is what it looks like when you put the two of those together. The green line is what the code has you do and the and the capacity is reduced versus the red line which is the theoretical. And the most important thing to remember here is that the reasons that the code reduces the capacity on this green curve here is for to account for residual stress and also to account for crookedness in the beam or in the column